Hello, Christopher. Hello, Avani. Can you hear me? You cannot hear me. You can hear me. Okay, great. Phew. All right. This has been a good afternoon, Yavi. All right. This has been an issue. We're getting better with this, but um, it will get better. Yes, you can hear me. Okay, great. Thank you. And let me know. It may go in and out. It was going in and out in the last class. Good afternoon. All right. So let me say it. But hello. hello. Well, first of all, hello, Michelle. Hello, Chris. Hello, Avani. Hello, Cheska. Hello. Hi, you. Hello, Amanda. Awesome. And hello, Michelle. And oh, wow. There's a lot of. All right. Good afternoon, Yavi. Good afternoon, Avani. Thank you, Yavi, for the feedback. Good afternoon, Matthew. Good afternoon, hi you. Good afternoon, Marilyn. Good afternoon, Amanda. Good afternoon, Cheska. Hello, Michelle. All right, and did I say Freddie? Wait, Fre hello, Freddie. I think that's it. And Melita, did I say Melita? Uh, okay. Anyway, all right, we're gonna get rolling in a set. Good afternoon, excellent. Okay. Um, we're gonna get rolling in two seconds. We're gonna get straight to homework four. Oh, I forgot to upload. There will, homework five. We're going to get through homework four today, believe it or not. We still have to circle back and do homework three. I am not forgetting, but we're, you know, we're moving along. Um, there will be a homework five put into the Google Classroom <clears throat> right at the end of this class. Of course, it's not due Monday. We don't, A, we don't have school Monday. B, it's a sacred holiday for many people. C, so they can't do work, whatever. Not whatever, but they can't. Okay. And C, um big homework it's long so <clears throat> i should have made clear to the other class um make a valiant attempt you get a lot of points right away if you make a valiant attempt at turning in a healthy portion of it for next wednesday but i will understand and expect that maybe many people won't have gotten through all of it by wednesday it, so the homeworks are getting harder and the homeworks are getting longer i mean like that's what happens um I think the beginning of the big of the next homework that will be assigned will be somewhat practicey, exercisey, reviewish from what we're learning now. But then it does build. Okay, so once here, so you know, just do your best. And as always, as always, as long as a portal is up, that means you're still. It's still not too late to turn something in for ultimately all the points. And again, as always, if you ever get anything back from me that is less than all the points. If you do have feedback, that means there's something you can do to still to get the rest of the points. And if you don't have yet have feedback, that means you're waiting for me and there's there's nothing that you should or could do um, that you'll eventually either get more feedback or more points or both. Um, I hope that's clear. So that it's not too late for anything ever for anybody yet. Like it's not. Um, so we're gonna go over, we're gonna continue. Go oh, uh, good afternoon, good afternoon. Okay, we're gonna continue going over homework four in like a moment. So I'm also gonna say it's very possible. We had a fairly productive class this morning with the other section. It's very possible that after we get to a certain point in homework four, I'm gonna branch and do something similar to last week. That is, we did one practice exercise in the other class this morning that was sort of helpful and sort of okay. But the truth is they lost audio anyway during it. So everything that was useful about the practice is all in the PDF of notes that will be uploaded to you. Okay, so I may or may not literally talk through the practice exercise again. I may just give you the notes. And instead, what we I'm hoping to do today is go to a slightly different direction and derive one more equation that will be very important and helpful for you to do the homework five. And so I'm saying all that to say that you're also then welcome if I do that, you should just be aware that the other class was um, that they that you might watch the video from the other class as well if you want a slightly more detailed walkthrough of the last uh, practice exercise that we just made up on the spot. But truthfully, the audio cut out anyway, so it's the notes will probably suffice for that. Okay, I don't know if that makes any sense or not. All right, we're going to start in a second. Hold on, um, but obviously, stop me at any time with any questions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Bear with me. The same. The top equation is in principle something you should know now. It's at the definition of average velocity. The middle equation is the definition of instantaneous velocity, right? It, it, it's starting to refer to calculus now saying that what it, acceleration at a moment, at a point in time or space is, is the 
rate of change, and velocity with respect to time, and velocity is rate of change of position with respect to time. So in the end of the day, acceleration is the second derivative of position with respect to time. Again, I'm just saying, I'm just like reviewing quickly for a second. The top equation is about average. The middle equation is about instantaneous. That is the top equation is about an interval between two points. It is easier to calculate, easier to understand, easier to use, but is approximate. It doesn't tell you what's going on precisely at any given point. The middle equation is precise. It tells you what's happening with acceleration at a point, but it's harder to use, harder to picture, harder to measure in the lab or in life. Um, and so that's why we have both. Um, and again, and that's a parallel to we have an average velocity equation and we have an instantaneous velocity equation. At some point soon, if not today, then next class, I will start like just rewriting all the equations we have so far, like on one clear sheet for you. But I, I think that at this point, we really have, in effect, um, we have four equations plus this one at the bottom would make five. That would make five equations. This one at the bottom is the goal, is, is the first goal of today. We haven't derived it yet. I haven't said anything about it yet, but it's what today is ultimately about. So that's where today is going. It's to the bottom equation, okay? And then ideally, we're gonna get one more by the end of today. So ideally, we're gonna get two new equations today. But all right, that's where we're going. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Oh, hello, Yiyun. I don't think I said hello, hello. Um, hi, okay. Um, so, and I'm gonna pause for a second. All right, so I'm gonna start right away here with, we're going to homework four. We're going to problem number, Roman numeral five in homework four. The question was about acceleration and direction. Um, the question was about acceleration and direction. Oh, and again, just like, like last time, I'm not walking through all the five-step method for all of these questions anymore, partly because I can't do that all the time anymore, like for time purposes. Also, some of these questions are more sort of like quick English check-in questions. And if it's a question like that, I I wouldn't, even if not on an exam, if it, even if we were on an exam, if it was a quick little, how do you think about this? I don't expect you to go through all the five steps for something like that either. The five steps are for solving problems, okay? So, um, so they, they give a situation here in problem five where they say this, at some point, a particle has a velocity of negative 17 meters per second. Um, uh, what is its speed if its velocity is negative 17? Well, its speed is 17. I think you're all getting used to that at this point. Velocity deals with direction. Speed does not deal with direction. So in effect, speed is the magnitude of the velocity vector, or put another way, speed is the absolute value of velocity. Okay. Um, Bear with me for one second, or, well, yeah, bear with me for one second. I just have to take one second. I'm sorry.
Radio. In out from your perspective, or is it just mine? Are you are you are you hearing okay when I talk, or does it go in and out and in and out? It's it's okay. Okay. It's cutting in and out a bit. But we can hear you now. This may happen one more time, but okay. So as you might be able to read my handwriting here, it, it, what does the negative indicate? What does plus or minus mean? And I know you know this, but I'm trying to get into the nuances now for a couple of reasons. Like the point of the negative is that it indicates direction. I know you know that. Negative, but the real question is what direction does negative mean? And this does come up a lot. What negative means is the opposite of positive. It means whatever way positive is, negative is the other way. Now, what way is positive? That for real. But what way is positive? Well, the whole thing is that is up to the physicist. That is up to the person solving the problem or the person setting up the problem or the person setting up the experiment or whatever. And this is very important. Ultimately, this is really the ultimate point of homework three is to drill this, is to drill down on this, that directions like the orientation of our coordinate system of our perspective on a problem is a choice. And it's really important that on the one hand, we always know we can make a choice, which direction is positive, which direction is negative. That is a choice, but it is a choice that we have to make. We have always these big choices to make in physics and you're gonna find they ultimately really make a difference. They do. They don't make a difference in the answer but they make a difference in how easy it is to get to the answer. This is the nature of physics. So, so it's actually really important that we consciously make decisions about how we're looking at things because one choice will make things a lot easier to look at and solve a lot of hassle versus another. Therefore, it's really important that we make a conscious decision and right at the beginning of a problem declare what our decision is. So, I mean, I'm over talking this as usual, but here in this problem where it says, what does negative mean? Well, it means the opposite of, of, of positive. But what does it actually mean? Does it mean east or does it mean forward or does it mean north? Well, the truth is that either the person writing the problem or the person solving the problem needs to have established that right at the beginning. Part of the purpose of step one, DFP, the reason I'm always going to ask you to, always, even though I'm not doing that right now, um, but we always have to write a diagram right at the beginning of a problem such as in the Berlin-Rome problem of yesterday, of Monday, we have to right away, even if someone doesn't tell us to, establish, here's my situation, and here's my zero point. And from now on, that way on the y-axis is positive. And from now on, say, that way on the x-axis is positive, or some other choice. But we always have to do that. So here in this problem, it's actually ambiguous what negative means. Like, no one has said it. But if we were to establish a coordinate system with a diagram, then for example, negative would mean the opposite of positive and positive, let's say, would mean north. Um, okay, now that we're gonna get into more detail now in, in part C. Oh my God, hold on. In part C, it says, part C, yes, um, does positive acceleration always mean speeding up? Okay, now this is important. This is again one of those things in physics, you may already understand this, and if you do, then, then you do, and good, but you really might not. Um, and it comes back to uh, the purpose of the whole Audi Buick Camry problem was meant to show that different scenarios could yield positive answers, like more than one scenario could yield a positive answer for acceleration. And more than one scenario uh, could um, for acceleration. Bear with me one more second.
So, when the question asks, does positive acceleration necessarily mean speeding up? I want to definitively say, no, it does not. And it's a, oh, someone's here, I'm sorry. And it's a common misconception. It is commonly misconceived that to say positive acceleration means speeding up. So I'm going to dwell on this for a minute. Um, first of all, now that we've entered physics, you may have remembered this from high school, we never say the word deceleration anymore. Oh, oh, oh sorry. Thank you, Amanda. I'm sorry. I see that now. I missed it. But thank you, Amanda, about Avani. That totally counts as multiplayer co-op, by the way. Like, you should submit for points. Like, thank you for helping our colleague. And sorry, Avani, if you're here. Yeah, well, she's connecting. Okay. Okay. Um, in English, there's a the word deceleration, but that is um, an English word. That is not a physics word. So, and you may remember that fact from high school, but now we have to be careful. What do we say in physics? We don't say deceleration. Well, we often say negative acceleration. But now what I'm here to make very clear to you is they're not the same thing. Exactly. In English, when people say deceleration or yeah, deceleration, they mean slowing down. They do. If someone says he decelerated in the car, he, they mean he slowed down. In physics, if we say an object has a negative acceleration, it does not necessarily mean slowing down. I want to be very clear about that. And similarly, conversely, positive acceleration does not necessarily mean speeding up. Why? Because it's very important to know the equation right here. Whoa, hello, hello. The equation right here in the middle like it's a math equation, we're using it to solve problems, but it's really saying an important concept, this thing right here. It's saying that ex uh, average acceleration is change in velocity per time. It's not change in speed. Remember, velocity is a vector quantity. It uh, includes magnitude and direction, where speed does not. Now here, so acceleration is the change in that. Here's a confusing thing. You may or may not have consciously realized this. Remember, we're distinguishing between scalar quantities, quantities without magnitude, versus vector quantities, quantities with magnitude. So remember, we had a running list, so we, at some point we had a running list, like distance is a scalar. It's a pure magnitude, it doesn't have direction. It's a vector, distance is the magnitude of what is known as the displacement vector, right? Right, okay, everybody knows that. Then speed, similarly, or let's say average speed, speed is the scalar, it's the magnitude of the velocity vector. Okay, fine, fine. But now when we get to acceleration, please note, there's an ambiguity in English. In English, there ain't no two words for acceleration. There's only one word. When we say, so that leaves confusion. That, that's why people get, I think it's part of why people get confused. From here on in, whenever I say the word acceleration, in a physics context, we have to assume that I mean acceleration in the vector sense. Like, again, we don't have two different words for it, but we mean acceleration, the vector. It cares about direction, and it is equal to the change in velocity per time, and, and velocity cares about direction. Why am I saying all this? Oh, because I'm a very boring person. Why am I saying all this? Because, therefore, to have a positive acceleration means for your velocity numbers to be going up. It means for your velocities to be increasing, but your velocity numbers could have been negative or they could have been positive. They'd be, po let's say right now, for example, in this context, let's say right now that positive means going that way. Uh, let's just say positive means going that way. So if I have a positive velocity, it means I'm going that way. If I have a negative velocity, it means I'm going that way. So if I have a positive acceleration, that means my numbers are going up. Well, they could be. They oh, and Avani's back again. I'm sorry. Oh, and when Avani oh, okay. so if velocity numbers are increasing, if the acceleration is positive, it could be like the velocity numbers are going positive ten, positive twenty, positive thirty, positive forty, positive, or it could be that the velocity numbers are going negative 40, negative 30, negative 20, negative 10, right? Both of those would be a case of positive acceleration, but they would look very different in the physical world. The first case would be a car going that way and going faster and faster and faster, right? Like positive 10, positive 20, positive 30, going faster. But the second case would be a car that's going that way, 
but it's originally going like negative 40, but then it's going negative 30. So it's still going that way, but it's magnitudes, it's speeds, right? Are going from like negative 30 to negative 20 to negative 20. So it's speeds are going lower. So positive acceleration absolutely could mean a car going faster as long as the car is moving in what we consider to be the positive direction or positive acceleration could mean a car going slower if the car happened to be moving in the other direction. That, please note that. I'm not at all, I'm yelling, not because I think it's obvious. I don't think it's obvious at all. I think that when we think about it, it ultimately makes sense. I think it all does fit together. And I can definitely tell you that it's super important, but please don't think that I'm saying it's obvious. I'm saying you might need to think about it, but you wanna get used to it. And the converse is true. From here on in, if someone says something has a negative acceleration, that just means, and, and by the way, for those of you who have taken physics before or kind of like are bored by this or whatever, the reason I have to make a big deal about this is like, think about the acceleration. I, I mean, think about the example of gravity, right? Where, where things accelerate like down. Imagine we consider down to be negative, right? When, thing, when things accelerate down due to gravity, they're always accelerating down due to gravity. They always have a negative acceleration. They always have a negative acceleration, whether it's because they're on their way up, slowing down. And so their velocity numbers are going like positive 40, positive 30, positive 20, positive 10, zero, right? That would be negative acceleration because those positive numbers are getting smaller and smaller. Or then when it comes back down, now the velocity numbers are going like zero, negative 10, negative 20, negative 30, right? So the velocity numbers are still getting smaller. It's just that they're getting increasingly negative now rather than decreasingly positive. So in both cases, whether something's going up, slowing down, or coming down, speeding up, both cases are called negative acceleration. And that's a very important example where that occurs. So just try for what it's worth. And again, if you like, you can ask me a question or make a note of it. Is Alani still trying to get back? Okay, uh, but just note that, please. That's the answer to that question. Okay, I know I'm like over talking it, but there you go. Um, all right, now we get to the next thing, which is a little bit maybe more important, and is um, um, uh, will lead us to the equation. Bear with me for one more second. I'm not going to do a whole audio thing, but I just. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm. Hold on. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, direct type person. Can you hear me now? Can you? I wasn't saying anything for the minute. I was typing something. Are we? Can you hear me now or no? Wait. Yeah. Okay. Um. So there's questions in the direct chat. To one of them, I'm just responding to personally, and I'm going to say okay. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so so there's a question in the chat. For the question on the screen now. Do we need the bots of that? Oh, all right. This is good for the question. For the question on the screen now, I'm going to talk about it a lot. Do we need the five step method? I think that's a very fair, you know, here's my most honest answer to that. Like, I'm not going to deal with the five step method here because I have too much to say about the substance of it. When you did your homework on this, do I care about the? I have a question like this. On the homework, I'm not going to get all bogged down if you had the five-step method or not, because I know it's like a very kind of unusual question. It's fine. I, I Even I don't exactly know what it would mean to draw a diagram for this. I will tell you, though, if I wrote something this, if I made a big deal about something like this in an exam, when in doubt, on an exam, when in doubt, go for the five-step method. Because this question does turn out to be important. So I, but I, But if you didn't do it in your homework, I'm not worried about it. And I'm not going to do it now. I don't know if that answers the question. But okay, here's the deal with this question. You had these lists of numbers, right? Most of which I wrote here and then some of which I didn't. And you were asked to calculate the mean, the arithmetic mean for each one of these lists. I believe that's what you were asked. I hope that's what you were asked. Oh, sorry. 
Um, and um, so in theory, you go to each list and in theory, you add up all the numbers and you divide by the number of numbers. I mean, I'm assuming that's what the question, it better be what the question has. <laughs> Hold on. Funny? I mean, so it says find the average of each set of elements. Really, it should have technically said find the arithmetic mean, but I, I'm sure I imagine you you assumed I meant that. But anyway, in principle, you add up all the numbers and divide by the number of numbers. And um, if you do that for the first answer, you get four. For the second one, you get seven. For the third one, you get nine. For the next one, you get 27. For the next one, you get 11. And then for the last one, if you add up all the numbers and add, divide by the number of numbers, you get 20. And I, I, I would imagine everybody agreed with all those answers. If you don't, please put it in the chat. But then what many of you might have noticed, and uh, what many of you might have noticed is that for a number of these lists, you could actually save a lot of trouble and find the average without adding up all the numbers and dividing. Or you might have noticed that if you divide up all the numbers and divide, you get an answer. And But if you just like, eyeball the middle number, I mean, to cut to the chase, if you just eyeball the middle number, it turns out in many of these cases to be the average. Even in, in the case of, even in the case of um, number five, even in the case of number five, well, okay, definitely in the case of one through four, the average is just the middle number, end of story. And i that's the, the first observation to make. That's, that's the trick it's talking about. Now, that's also even true in list number five, although I want to alert us all to the fact that number five is a little bit unusual. I mean, a little bit different from the other four because list number five, first of all, they do this little tricky thing where they don't put the numbers in an obvious order. Right, I mean, they switch the eight, they I switch the eight and the six, so so the numbers are written out of sequence. But but when you average, you just add and then you divide. So addition is commutative, so it doesn't actually turn out to affect anything that the numbers aren't in order. In other words, we could put the order, the numbers in order for ourselves if that makes it easier, and then still use that trick. But also in number five, as you might notice, there actually isn't a middle number. It's an even number of numbers, but even there, if you just interpolate what the middle number would have been, or in other words, if you take the number that's in the middle of the two middle numbers, 10 and 12, if you take that middle number, 11, it, that turns out to be the average. Okay, I mean, I, I imagine many people notice things like that. For the last sequence, the last sequence is definitely a pattern. I, I mean, it's not like it's not. A, I mean, it's not like as long as numbers are in a pattern, this trick works, because the last sequence is in a pattern. It's just a different pattern. The last sequence is the perfect squares. You may or may not have noticed, but but the average of all the numbers there is 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 twenty, which is not the dead center uh, middle of all these numbers. Well, what can we infer from this? We can infer a couple of things. When it comes to raw numbers, what we seem to be saying is, when it comes to raw numbers, the medium can be the medium under a certain condition. Let me back up. Note the <clears throat> note. The, the note up in the margin, like mean and median do not mean the same thing. They don't have the same definition, right? As far as triple equal signs are concerned, mean does not have the same definition as median. The arithmetic, like, you know, there's many different types of averages. There's mean, there's median, there's mode, there's geometric mean. M arithmetic mean means that thing where you add up all the numbers and you divide by the number of numbers. Median means the number that's actually in the middle once you've arranged all the numbers in a sequence. Well, they don't mean the same thing. And by, and there's no reason to assume that in general they're the same thing. They certainly aren't the same thing in the very last list. However, apparently it seems to be the case that if we meet a certain condition, so if I say if and only if 
the numbers that we're dealing with change at a constant rate, if they're all increasing or, dis or decreasing by the same amount, then it seems that the mean is the median, not triple equal sign, but double equal sign. They don't mean the same thing, but they'll have the same result, the same numerical value. If the numbers are increasing or decreasing by a constant amount, I mean, even in the limiting case, the extreme case where the constant amount is zero, that certainly is the case. Um, <clears throat> turns out to be an important observation for physics. So I want to say more about it. And of course, I want to apply it to physics. But the first thing I'm saying is if you can arrange a whole bunch, like it's not good enough to arrange them in order. You have to arrange them in order. But once you arrange them in order and you look at them, if they are stepping up by the same amount always or stepping down by the same amount always, then the average is dead center in the middle. Now, why is that? Well, that's because if they're, if they're always increasing or decreasing by the same amount, that means whatever is whatever the total sum of all the numbers that's above the average necessarily is above the average by the same amount as all of the numbers that are below the average, right? If we're always growing by the same amount, then the whole point of the middle number is everything to the left of it is, if you added it all up, would be below it by exactly the same amount as everything to the right of it, above it. So they would cancel each other out. and in the middle would be the average. I mean, I think I think that, in other words, if it's increasing or decreasing by a constant amount, the whole list is symmetric around the middle. Okay, so what? Good question, so what? Well, there's one more thing to say about this. Take the example, uh, wait, did I? Yeah. Well, yeah, well, well let me pause on that. Also notice, it goes a little bit further. I, so, so far my finding is as long as, if and only if, numbers are increasing or decreasing by a constant amount, then the average does lie right in the middle. That's what I'm saying so far. But then look carefully, please, at, li and I might be missing something missing in the chat, I'm going back and forth between screens. Um, um, if you look uh, carefully at list number five, right, where there is no obvious middle number, I mean, there's only six numbers there, but I say that the average is, is 11. And 11 is, if you look at it, 11 is what would, you know, is, is the number that would be in the middle if, if, um, what do I mean by it would be in the middle? Well, specifically, I mean that 11 is what you would get if you average the two numbers right around it, 10 and 12, right? Like, it's not just in the middle. I mean, it's literally the average. If you added 10 plus 12, 22, divide by two, you get 11, right? Okay, that probably makes sense. It's equidistant from the two numbers around it. But now let's think about what I just said a minute ago. Like the whole thing is symmetric. Whatever, however we're growing to the right, we're shrinking to the left. So if I wanted to get that number 11, if you think about it, I could take a step over. And remember in your mind, arrange all those numbers, in your mind, arrange all those numbers in sequence. So in your mind, think of it as six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, right? Well, if you do that, and by the way, we're about to get interrupted for a minute by everybody's favorite. <laughs> Um, or maybe we're not if they go through the other door, which would be nice, but okay. But I apologize in advance if we get interrupted for a second. So if you arrange those numbers in your mind as 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, you can take the same logic and shift over. Say, go, go over one step in each direction. Take eight and add it to 14. You'll get 22, divide by two and you get 11. Or shift over again, go six. Remember again, arrange the numbers in order in your mind. Go to the lowest number, six. The highest number, 16. Add them together, you get 22. Divide by two, that's 11. So whoa, wait, so what am I saying here? I mean, in a way, I'm just demonstrating what I explained before, that the reason the average is the middle is because everything's symmetric around the middle. If and only if we're always increasing or decreasing by a constant rate. But now I'm saying something further. I'm saying if that's all really true, that means that one way you could find the middle Say the list was so freaking long that like you didn't want to write down all the numbers, right? Or say someone just gave you, oh, hello, okay, hi, hi, okay, hi, good to see you. Okay, teaching, hi, okay, hi, love you. Okay, I'll see you in an hour, we'll go to horses. Okay, love you. Okay. So, so say the, okay, say the list was so, okay, say the list was so long. Say the, 
Oh, is Yavi back? Oh, oh my God. Oh, sorry. So I'm going back for the the waiting room. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. The problem is I'm the reason I don't I'm missing the chat sometimes is because I'm I'm looking at the actual sheet. I'm sorry. Uh sorry, how long was that waiting? I'm sorry how long you were waiting. Um okay. Um so without making a new point. Say someone gave you a really super long list that was too long to write down all the numbers, or even better, maybe they don't even give you a list. Maybe they just give you a description. Like they say, I want all, I want all the numbers from one to a thousand counting by two or something, right? Okay, that's like enormous. But what it seems like we're, so I, and they say, oh, thank you. Sorry, I'm so sorry to keep you guys waiting. I know I'm going back and forth. I'm sorry about that, uh, the waiting room people. Um, and, and if you were, no apologies necessary, it's my fault. But if you were one of the people that keeps getting stuck in the waiting room, maybe look at the direct chat because I, I sent you a message about something else, just saying. Um, okay. Um, thank you, thank you. Okay, awesome. Um, so when someone they said, I want the average. I want the average, the arithmetic mean of all of the numbers written from one to a thousand counting by twos, like do it now. Well, clearly, I don't want to add up all the numbers from one to a thousand counting by two. I mean, that's like 500 numbers. Second of all, I'm not sure I can immediately necessarily pick what's right or picture what's right in the middle. Maybe I sort of can, but I don't even know offhand if it's an even number of numbers or an odd number. So I don't even know if the middle, like I might think, is the middle number 500 or wait, would that be the middle if I went from zero to a thousand or is the middle number 501? Like I could have that legitimate confusion. What this next trick is saying, what this next discovery is saying is, Actually, what I could do is literally just take the lowest and the highest, add them together and divide by two, and that would be the middle number, right? Like literally, like pause, think about that for a second. That's what that list number four is saying. Like if you see in list number four that the average of the whole thing is 11, which is the number that would be in the middle, even though it's not even one of the numbers. So I don't even see 11 written there. I literally don't even see 11 written there, but I could have known that 11 was the average if actually I just looked at the lowest number six and added it to the highest number 16. And in fact, that's all I would have had to have been told is the limits, the endpoints of this range. If someone just said from six to from six to um, um, uh, to 22, counting by threes or whatever it was, I just add together, divide by two, and the average is 11. So that's actually some kind of trick or insight for raw numbers. Ultimately, what I'm saying now is what it says on the board that, first of all, the mean would be the median as long as we're always increasing or decreasing by a constant rate. But second of all, that median is literally the arithmetic mean of just the endpoints of the lowest and the highest. Why? Again, because the whole thing is symmetric if and only if we're increasing or decreasing by a constant rate. So what, so I'm saying there's two insights that we can make about raw numbers and averages as long as we are changing the numbers by a constant interval. What does that have to do with physics? Well, imagine that each, it has a lot to do with physics. Imagine that each of these numbers is a particular instantaneous velocity occurring at a particular like moment in time, specifically equal moments in time. So if you look at your lists, imagine that each one of those is like a reading on a speedometer or a reading on a radar gun. And each reading is being spat out every second or every two seconds or every three seconds, but just at equal time intervals. Okay. Then now we're talking physics now. So each one of those numbers is like a meter per second reading. So now we're talking a situation in physics where we have velocities that are changing right? Velocities that are changing every second. So we're talking about a situation now where we're talking about acceleration, right? It, like if we're looking at readouts of velocity numbers that are continually changing, then we're talking about situations that involve acceleration. And stop me if that doesn't make sense. But what In here says we not just that the numbers are changing, but that they're changing in a constant way. 
So physics-wise, the condition that we're now looking at, the condition that we're looking at is constant acceleration. That's the topic that this enters us into in physics. We're now talking about situations where velocity numbers are changing, but the rate at which they're changing is not changing. That's a little complicated, I, I think. In terms, we're now talking about a situation where we have first derivative called velocity. The first derivative is changing. So we have a second derivative called acceleration. But the second derivative is remaining constant. So the, there is no third derivative. The third derivative is zero. In calculus terms, that's what we're now looking at. We're looking at a situation where there's a change, but there's a change in position called velocity. There's a change in that velocity. There's a first derivative. There's a second derivative, but there's no change in the change in the change. There's no third derivative. That's a mouthful. I'm going to say one last way. Number, but I'm saying this is a very special condition. This is a very special situation that leads to a lot of calculational and predictive power. As long as velocities are changing, but in an unchanging way, and then we can do this averaging trick. As long as velocities are like always going up, but always going up by 10 meters per second every second or something, or always going down by say 9.8 meters per second every second, then, then, the mean, then the average velocity, there we go. Instantaneous velocities are increasing or decreasing or changing in time by a constant amount. That's what we're talking about here. I mean, I can go back to that page in a second, but that's what I just said. If instantaneous velocities are increasing or decreasing, changing in time by a constant amount. So in other words, as long as acceleration exists, but is a steady value, right? That's what we're saying here. And I'm going to write it in symbolic form in a minute. Of course, we're going to turn this into an equation in a minute. But in English, I'm saying then, then the average velocity for an entire interval between two points will be the same, will be double equal sign equal to as two things. Two things. Like if you if you have, like basically what I'm saying is if you know the average velocity for a whole interval, which is like always the first thing we always calculate in all of these problems, like the one thing we know is average velocity is defined to be displacement per time. So if you know the, uh, the, the displacement per time for a whole interval, what, and if you also know that acceleration is a constant, then what we're saying is now you have two more important facts at your disposal that we wouldn't have had before. Fact number one, fact A here is, then you know that whatever you got for average velocity for the whole thing is also the instantaneous velocity right in the middle of the whole thing. What do I mean by the middle of the whole thing? I mean the middle of the time. What do I mean by the middle of the time? I mean literally total time divided by two. Like that is insight number one. I'm going to say it again. Of course, I'm going to write it as an equation, but it's like a major insight and it's a subtle insight. I'm saying because acceleration is constant, and it must be constant for this to be true. If and only if acceleration is constant, then the average velocity that you know for an entire interval between two points is the same as, is double equal sign, the same value as the instantaneous velocity at one particular point, the point right in the middle of the whole time, the point at over two. That's point number one, or you know, point number A here. And and reason it's so important is remember I keep saying average is something we know for an interval between two points. Averages are easier to calculate, easier to measure, and easier to picture, but they're approximate. An average for a whole interval doesn't tell you what's going on at any given point in the interval, right? Like if you're going average 50 miles per hour. Journey, that doesn't mean you're going, that means on average, you're going 50 miles an hour, right? So this trick is saying, okay, so so average is something we can picture and calculate and measure for a whole interval between two points, but it is approximate. Instantaneous velocities are precise. Instantaneous velocities are how fast you're going at 
a given point in a journey, they're more precise, but they're harder to picture, harder to measure, harder to get right away, harder to calculate and, as a first step in any problem. So what we have now is sort of a trick to get a technique to get from an approximate average to a very particular instantaneous velocity. What we're saying now is you may be changing your velocity all the while through some journey, but if you're changing it in a constant way, then as long as you get the average for the whole thing, you'll know that is the instantaneous velocity, not everywhere, only at one particular point. But the one particular point you'll know is the point right in the middle. Okay, so that's so it's a way of shifting our knowledge from an average to an instant is using this trick. And I'm gonna write it as an equation again in a second. But the second part of the trick or the technique or the observation or whatever is that that instantaneous velocity that we can calculate right in the middle of the time must in fact be the average of the instantaneous velocity, of the lowest instantaneous velocity and the highest instantaneous velocity. It must be like, because going back to what we said before, the symmetry, must be you must be you must we could know it by just saying first instantaneous velocity plus last instantaneous velocity divided by two will automatically give us that middle velocity so now we have a lot more suddenly now as long as acceleration is constant so this becomes a very important condition in physics as i keep saying as long as acceleration is constant then we can suddenly get knowledge about a bunch of instantaneous velocities, even though we thought or we started with only having rough knowledge of a whole average. It starts to allow us to fill in particular points when we think we just have a summary of everything that's going on between the two points. Okay, that's in English what we're saying here. And we're extrapolating this all from what we just understand to be true of numbers. Oh, 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 oh the, I'm sorry, the question. So everything I, I'm talking a lot. But what I'm talking about is the very last question on homework four. I mean, and by the way, this means we're going to be done with homework four in a couple of minutes. But everything I'm saying, well, literally I'm talking about question, sorry, problem six, which is called averages and midpoints. Problem six in homework four, what I'm literally talking about is part B, where it says, how is the sixth sequence above different from the others? What trick can be used to find the average of the first five? I'm yammering out the top of my lungs about what I'm saying is the answer to that question was the trick that you could use is that as long as the numbers were, um, sorry, the trick that could be used is you could say that the average for the whole thing was the number right in the middle. The mean for the whole was the median. But then when it says in the question, in what situations can this trick be used and what situations can it not? This is where I'm like, I'm expanding massively. The situations where that trick can be used are whenever numbers are increasing or decreasing in a constant way. So now I'm leaping off, and in a minute I'm gonna ask, I think it was, I'm gonna ask whoever asked that to clarify if they're okay now, because it's, it's a very fair question, like where the heck am I in this class? Where I'm at is part B of question six, but I'm now using part B to teach something. I mean, that's the purpose of the problem. When it says in what situations can this trick be used and what situations can it not, I'm now, I've answered that. The situations that it can be used are the numbers must be changing in a constant way. So now I'm going out of that saying the purpose of all of that, I'm like taking all these notes for the last three pages and saying, this relates to physics. This discovery applies to physics. If you assume all those numbers there, or you imagine all those numbers there to be meters per second, velocity readouts at successive points in time, then, uh, then everything I just said about numbers can apply to velocities. I'm saying ultimately, so I guess I'll cut to the chase now. Well, let me just look to see. Did that, um, did that help, Chris? Did that help? Did that clarify? Or is Crystal there? Wait, did I lose Chris? Okay. Um, hopefully that helps. Assume that helps, and I'm going to go on. So I'm now going to turn this into. So, but to everybody, this is new knowledge now. I'm now teaching. We're done with the sheet. We use the sheet to lay out some concepts. I'm now. That's the end of, and that last question about the thing on the website, I think I put it in your sheet. There's no website, don't worry about that. But, but the equation it's referring to is what I want to get to with all of this. And so that's where I'm going, but, or, or one of the equations. So I'm now teaching, like put down the homework, it's now notes. I'm now teaching and I'm saying what we can infer from everything I just said, what we can infer from what we just did on that question. Now, symbolically, we can say from here on in, 
if, remember, IFF means if and only if. So from now on, if and only if acceleration is a constant, right? That's what A equals A naught means. It means if what, and it doesn't mean zero. I'm saying for here on in, situations where we have acceleration, changing, in other words, hold on. Velocity is constant, right? I'm looking at situations now where velocity is not constant, where the velocity is changing. Therefore, there is acceleration, right? Because acceleration is change in velocity per time. So if we're looking at situations now where there is a change in velocity per time, therefore, there is an acceleration, but that value of acceleration itself is remaining constant. Again, this is a little bit of a headache the first time you think about it. Honestly, it's a headache all times that you think about it, if you think about it hard enough. Um, but we're looking at situations where there is a change in velocity, but there's no change in that change. So for example, we're looking at situations where like every second a car speeds up by 10 meters per second, as opposed to like the car in one second is going 10 meters per second, and then the next second it's going 30 meters per second, and then the next second it's going 90, like something like that where the car is wildly speeding up is not what we're talking about. We're talking about if in t equals one, it's going 10, and t equals 10 meters per second, and if t equals two, it's going 20 meters per second, and if t equals three, it's going 30 meters per second. Those kind of situations. If we're in that kind of situation where acceleration is a constant, okay, so that's the condition, that's the condition, then the average velocity for the whole interval will equal the average of the very first velocity, the very first instantaneous velocity, like, like added to the very last instantaneous velocity, divided by two, right? This is a new equation. This is absolutely a new equation. And, and it's a very important equation. It looks simple. It is simple, but it's deceptively simple. It's not easy. Let's take a couple of things about this equation. First of all, what I'm saying in English is, aren't there a certain condition the average velocity for a whole interval is equal to the average of the lowest and highest instantaneous velocities. I'm actually saying that now. I'm saying under a certain condition. If you want to know the average for the whole thing, you can take the lowest and the highest and put them and add them together and divide by two, and that will work. But it only works if the acceleration is a constant. For example, it did not work in the Hill figure problem or the Grandma Grimm problems, like those where we just try to average 40 and 60 and get 50, those don't work because acceleration was changing there from zero to something to zero. Like I, That's another discussion, but but we're saying as long as acceleration is a constant, then you can do this. Note a couple of things, I'm looking at the time. No, so this is a new equation. Note a couple of things. It's a new equation for how the clock aware of caution don't be thrown we yes we already have an equation for average velocity we now average velocity is that important we now have two different equations for average velocity they don't confuse them please and don't think they're redundant and don't think they're con i mean you might they're not redundant and they're not contradictory the bottom one the bottom one this one is what we still will always use first in any problem if you ever wonder which one do i use the bottom one is always your first go-to because the bottom, and that's why we learned it first, because the bottom one is a definition. It's never false. It's just sometimes not fully helpful, but it's always true. So you always get credit for it if you write it down and it will always start a thinking process. The bottom one, I'm saying, always true. But sometimes it doesn't get all the information that we need. Sometimes, for example, sometimes we, or sometimes we don't have the time or something like that. Also, that bottom one doesn't get us anywhere. It doesn't tell us anything about any information at a point. It only tells us about the interval between two points. So now we have this new equation that allows us to get, move back and forth between averages, average velocities and instantaneous velocities. But beware, the second equation, which can be super useful, it can solve problems where no other equation can, this equation is our first is our first double equal sign equation. 
It's the first equation we have that isn't always true. It's only sometimes true. So you have to be really careful of it. It's only true if you know for a fact that acceleration is not changing, okay? So this equation is for that. Well, one more page on this. Like, when is it useful? New equation useful, and of course we're going to do concrete examples with it, like a, a lot of concrete examples. But when is this equation useful? Um, well, again, it's o it's only useful when it's true, and it's only true if a equals a naught. So you have to know that for a fact first. You either have to be told it, or you have to have really good reason to believe it that the acceleration exists but is constant. So as long as you meet that condition, then the two places where this equation is useful is one. For example, if, if you don't know anything about the time and you're not being asked anything about the time, then um, uh, equation because average velocity, the other one refers totally to time. So number one, it's useful when you don't have any knowledge or information about time. But second of all, the real more subtle but more important thing is this equation is useful when you're trying to shift your attention from an approximate value for a, an interval between two points when you're trying to shift from that to needing, when you need actual knowledge of individual points, this equate, like the actual velocity instantaneously at particular instance, this equation allows you to do that. Uh, now, to see that in practice, we have to see it in practice. We have to do example, but that's what it's for. Um, now we're gonna pause here, to, okay. It's 403, oh, oh, good, there's a question in the chat. Hold on a second. Really good question. I'm not going to say the name, obviously. It is a really good question. Um, and I'm going to tell you in advance, the answer is no. But, well, kind of, but it's a really important question for everybody. So, does the change of acceleration, I'm, I'm reading it verbatim because it's that important. The question says, so, does the change of acceleration need to be constant for this to be true? That's a great question because it gets exactly at the trickiness of everything I'm saying. It so directly gets at the trickiness of what I'm saying that even the question itself is kind of tricky. It's kind of confusing. It's not confusing, but it's tricky. Here's the deal. I'm going to read it one more time. I want everybody to listen to this carefully. And I'm not critiquing. The person who submitted this question should submit for a bajillion points. Okay, it's a great question. I'm about to pick it apart a little bit. Please don't be insulted. I'm about to pick it apart in the same way that I'm picking apart physics. It's not to insult the question. I'm thrilled that the question is being asked and you should submit for a million points. But let's be really careful about this. This shows how careful we have to be about the words and everything in physics. What are you saying? Does the change of acceleration need to be constant for this to be true? The good news about their question is they're showing that they're picking up on a big theme that I am saying. The big theme that I'm saying is the acceleration needs to be constant for this to be true. For this new equation to be true, I am saying A must be. That is what I'm saying. And yes, that is what this math, like when I write A equals A naught, that is what I mean. Acceleration must be constant. So to what I think the person's thinking in their head or picking up on, on my answer is a resounding yes, that is a big, big point. But just uh, to be as responsible as I can, I just want you to notice that what the person actually, this is how confusing these things get. Well, I'm going one step further. I'm saying yes, acceleration must be constant. Which really means I'm saying the change in velocity must be constant, okay? I'm saying accelerate for all this to be true, for this new equation to be true, acceleration must be constant, or if you want to put it a different way, change in velocity must be constant. But I want you to note that the person in the question, this is how slippery and subtle these things get. What the person asked was, does the change of acceleration, they said, does the change in acceleration need to be constant for this to be true. They didn't say, does the acceleration need to be constant? They didn't say, does the change in the law? And I'm not critiquing, I'm trying to like illuminate something here because this happens all the time. If they had said, does the acceleration need to be constant for this to be true, I'd say yes. If they had said, does the change in velocity need to be constant for this to be true, I'd say yes. 
They said, does the change of acceleration need to be constant for this to be true? You know, my real, real answer to that is, and if you, you'll really know you're getting this if you follow what I'm about to say. My real answer to, does the change of acceleration need to be constant for this to be true? My real answer is the change of acceleration needs to be zero for this to be true. That's okay. The acceleration has to be a constant for this to be true. The change, so that means the acceleration needs to be constant. That means the acceleration must be not changing at all. That means there must be no change in the acceleration for this to be true. So my real, real ultimate answer is for all this to be true, the change in velocity must be constant. Therefore, the acceleration must be constant, like any number it wants, but it has to be the same number all the time. But therefore, the change in acceleration must be the number zero. Now, I don't know if that was too much information or what, but if you, I'll tell you this, if I lost some of you somewhere, including the person that asked, well, the person that asked the question, I hope they tell me in the direct chat whether I help them or not. I really do hope that. But all the rest of you, if I lost you somewhere in the middle, okay. We'll come back to it again. But any of you who literally followed what I just said, I think you can tell yourself that you literally get this whole concept. Like that would be a good litmus test. Let me go on. Uh, wait. Also, I hope the other I hope that Chris know well anyway. Um, okay, so now what I'm gonna do. We have 12 minutes. Okay, we have 12 minutes left. The rest of the notes are about a particular example that I did with the other class. You'll find them in the notes when I upload. And it's not hard or anything. It's just a concrete example, like an exercise, to show how this equation can be useful. Okay? So I'm going to leave it to you to check that out in the notes. And if you want to check out that part of the video, feel free. But what I'm going to do with you guys now instead, and we're going to ask other people to watch, is I'm going to skip. derive yet one more equation for you that will be really helpful for the next homework for homework five. So here we go. So, and I'm going to do it by, well, example like let's say we've like what sounds like standard physics now we have some car that starts with a certain speed maybe it starts from rest or maybe in this case it starts at an initial velocity of five meters per second which just means it was like already going when we started our stopwatch right like it's already going it's up to a speed of five meters per second instantaneous velocity of five meters per second we start our stopwatch and it's moving now but it's not moving at a constant speed let's say it's moving at a constant rate of acceleration like it's gaining five meters per second every second and let's say it does that for 10 seconds. How how far does it get? Like that's like a straightforward physics question. How far does it get in this much time if it's accelerating at that rate? Well, the, 
this we got to do something here like we can't what, what a lot of people might want to do is say like oh well i guess if it's going at a rate of five and it does it for 10 seconds i guess i'll multiply five by 10 and get 50 or something so i guess it's going 50 or something like that but please but it's not that straightforward remember it's not that every second it's moving at a velocity of five meters per second it's that every uh second it's gaining five more meters per second of velocity so it's going faster and faster and faster so we can't just do something simple like distance equals rate times time we can't just say displacement equals average velocity times time we don't know the average velocity so what i'm going to do i'm going to talk about this different ways next week but to save you time and hassle what i'm going to say is right now we can figure this out based on the equations that we have we have a couple of gdps that are useful here i'm going to put them together to get one new GDP that is kind of a shortcut. So, Awesome. So I'm going to do some algebra now. With seven minutes left, I'm going to derive a new equation. Okay, but I'm going to derive a new equation to get the answer to this question. So we know displacement equals average velocity times time. Or put another way, we know like that looks like distance equals rate times time. Basically, we could say, oh, okay, we want to know how far it's getting in five seconds. Well, we'll just multiply by the average velocity. By the time by the average velocity and add wherever it initially was in, in this and right, we could do that okay. velocity okay. velocity okay. the constant therefore we know now condition that if acceleration is a constant, then average velocity is the average of the initial and final velocities. So I can plug that in over here. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, and if you need me to go back a page, I will. Sorry. So we're getting somewhere and we were given the initial velocity and I know we have five minutes left. We're good. We, we, we were given the initial velocity. So it looks like we know most of the things that would have to be plugged in here, but we still don't know the final velocity. But we do, in our head we do like, like, do I know how fast this thing is going at the end? No, I don't know. But I know it's gaining five meters per second every second. It started at five, and there's a pattern. There's acceleration. It's gaining five meters per second every second. So in my head, it feels like I could do something like, well, if it's gaining five meters per second every second for 10 seconds, then isn't it going to gain 50 meters per second of velocity? And it started with five, so won't it end with 55? I don't know if you could picture that in your head or not, but if you can't picture it in your head, all I'm really doing in my head is I'm using the definition of acceleration. I'm saying we, another thing we know is the definition of average acceleration is change in velocity per time. So if I rearrange that, if I want to know the final velocity of something, I just rearrange. I say, oh yeah, it's the amount of time that it was traveling times the average acceleration plus whatever velocity it started with. I'm just rearranging the definition of average acceleration. Why did I do that? I might be losing certain people now. You might want to look at this in notes, but why did I do that? Because, because now that is an expression that I can plug in for V, the one thing I don't know. 
right? So I'm going to go one more page. Again, maybe I'm going to like look at this, let it sink in when you get home. But I'm saying, so far I'm saying, oh, and remember my goal is I'm looking for X as a function of T. I'm looking for X. I'm looking for some way to relate T and get out X with the, with the knowns that I have. So now I have, so far, I've X equals what I had before, right? But, but I just made a substitution for V. So now I'm saying X equals V plus, excuse me, X equals V naught plus A T plus V naught, right? All over two. And we're almost there. It may look very complicated, but I could start simplifying now. Like I have a V naught plus a V naught. So that's two V naught. It's all times T, right? So it's all over two. So I can say, oh, I can, I can distribute the T now. So I could say, okay, A T squared plus two V naught over two. Out those twos left with a t squared plus a school or you may not. This is our final equation. We have one minute. Oh, oh, and to answer the final, to answer our question here, just to answer the exercise. So here, and this is our last thing. If T equaled, I think 10, I'll check the answers in it. And V naught equaled five, I believe, and A equaled five, I believe. That's what we said. I think those were the values. Yeah. Just about done, we are done. X equals one half five times 10 squared plus five times 10 plus zero, like if you started at zero. So in this case, we would get um, 250 plus 50, 300. And that was the answer. And what's the summary of the whole thing? I don't care. That, that's the answer to the exercise. And you can look at it at home and all that. And I know class is over, but I don't care so much about the answer to the exercise. What I really care about is we just derived a fifth equation, or a sixth equation. X equals one half AT squared plus V naught T plus X. That's what we, from now on, that's like our distance equals rate times time go to when the rate that we know is a constant rate of acceleration. That And you'll, this will be very useful in the, in the homework that's due next Wednesday, okay? This is a fair game equation now. Oh, and notice it's a double equal sign though. This is only true if acceleration is a constant, because we use that condition to derive this. So this is called a constant acceleration equation. It's only true as long as A is a number that exists, but doesn't change. But that is class. You've been very, very patient. Have, I'll post, I didn't post the homework yet, but I will in a second. Um, have a great weekend and holiday. And yes, have a uh, good Yom Tov or whatever, et cetera. Bye, bye, okay. And. Anybody asked to hang out for a second, please hang out. Thank you. Have a good day. And I'll turn off the recording. Awesome. Bye. Have a good day. Thank you. Have a good day.